Marcia. Hocam bir şey seyirler. Oturacaklar lazım ki ilerleyelim. Sandalye ayarlayalım. Yok ekstra. Yes. 
Can I see any, those in favour of a, the sort of normal starting time and finishing? Eight o'clock, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I propose the next one. Nine thirty. Um, can I just say that it depends on what we would like to do between that time and the dinner. Dinner at seven o'clock. I just didn't want to tire you so tire you so much. That's the reason why I'm stopping. Very wise. How about the good field? So you are leave more time for a, a summation discussion with you. At the pool. <laughs> <laughs> if if we were to put Ricardo and Ben in the morning and then lunch and then Radhika first after lunch, we could be we could be done by 1430, 1500. I would have thought. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. The only concern I have is that yeah, um, yeah, the, the there's time a large difference. time gap between, you know, so she will have to wake up like, I don't know, four or five to mm. knock her off. That's her problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's, it's difficult for me to arrange this, so let me, let me leave it with Churan to see what he... No, but no, we can if agree you think it's I will let her know. So oh, okay. Well, we can agree to start at 9.30. Can we agree to start at 9.30 tomorrow? Oh, yeah. 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 All right, let's, let's, let's do that then. Let's start at 9.30 and bring everything through. I thought we were just going to agree to it. Yeah, right, but let's, this lot. I'm going to now move this on. I think we're going to spend it the time on this. So, we now have, if I've got the pronunciation right, Uzga or Ngazi. That's good. Yeah. Um, who's going to kick off now? Well, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to follow uh, John's suggestion of uh, saying what I'm saying in this paper in one sentence and how it's contributing. Uh, the basic argument I'm making in this paper is uh, that financialization is not a symptom of uh, underlying problems. It's not necessarily a disease either, but it's rather a part of the structural transformations that took place in the post 1980 era, and uh, more importantly, it does have uh, significant and contradictory effects on the capital accumulation. Uh, and I'm basically going to be talking about the US context here, so uh, that's where I'm going to be starting. So, there are basically three questions about financialization, and financialization was a concept, a word that was thrown out a lot in this conference, in this workshop as well. and there are three basic questions that I see now. The first one is, what are we actually talking about? What is financialization? That's sort of like that's where we should start from. Uh, the second question is, uh, why has it occurred? Okay. And the third question is, like, how did it affect uh, the system? What were the consequences of financialization? Uh, some of the sort of confusion about the concept uh, or different users, I guess, originates from the fact that it's a... Oscar, you seem, you seem to be getting feedback. Maybe you what should I do? Should I do? Should Lower the yeah. Lower? Yeah. How is it now? Yeah. Better? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Turan, in his presentation, showed the results of the Google search of the concept financialization, which, you know, if you look at it, actually increases after the crisis. You know, after the 2007-2008 crisis. In fact, when I first started like uh, working on financialization, that's about like 2003. When I googled it, there were two pages that came up. You know, like, that was like two links, and then you know somehow uh, that contributed to the vagueness, uh, I guess, of the concept, and seems like it's basically uh, used in many different ways. So I want to first uh, start with the. Uh, definition of financialization, what I understand what uh, is a useful, practical concept, uh, how we can use it in a useful way. And then I'll briefly talk about how I see finance uh, in Marxian theory, Marxian economic theory. And then from there on, I'll uh, discuss the literature on the causes of financialization and then uh, make a few arguments about the effects of financialization uh, on the system. So this seems to be uh, the general definition that pretty much everybody is uh, using. That is, you know, there's an increase uh, in the size and significance of the financial market, financial institutions, financial transactions, and so on. But this, you know, 
this is a very sort of like general and bad concept that's not really operational in the sense that uh, it doesn't have as much uh, in terms of what actually is going on. So uh, I'm okay with this, but there's a second sort of like more narrower, uh, the narrower definition of financialization that I uh, prefer to use, which essentially refers uh, to the changes that took place in the relationship between the financial markets and the non-financial uh, sector, especially the non-financial uh, corporations. And these changes uh, have two sides. Okay? On one side, what happened was that there was increased involvement of non-financial co corporations in financial uh, operations, financial investments. And this is an important issue, I guess, because there's a lot of, uh, one of the other things that was thrown out a lot in this workshop was the profit rate. And uh, what is in that profit rate, especially after 1990s, is that there's a significant portion of those profits of those non-financial corporations are coming from their financial operations. So we kind of like need to think about how we conceptualize them when we're talking about the profit rate. So that's one side of this changing relationship. On the other side of this uh, change is, and that's again, I talked about it, uh, the increase that the financial markets uh, pressure on the non-financial corporations, which meant one of the aspects was the shareholder value changes, uh, which meant an increasing amount of resources were being transferred to the financial markets. So, uh, Shade has demonstrated that the decline in the interest rate actually you know, sort of increased the profit of the enterprise, but uh, at the same time when there was a decline in the interest rate, there was actually an increase in the uh, dividend payments and stock buybacks that went to the financial markets. And all these things had uh, different effects on the system as, uh, as I'll discuss. So, but before I do that, I just want to say that the way I sort of like conceptualize finance in this, uh, in this paper is to see uh, that finance is, has a contradictory role on the whole system, on the capital accumulation process. On the one side, Finance, financial markets are required to support the capital accumulation process. It is thanks to the financial markets that the capital accumulation process uh, can actually go beyond the savings, for example. That is what you need. And I'd say that that's not, only, that's not the only function, of course, but once accumulation starts, once accumulation sort of like picks up, it actually changes both the pace and speed of accumulation as well. So the, the financial market setup the availability of the funds, the demands of the financial markets have significant uh, impacts on the pace, of, uh, the pace and speed of accumulation. However, at the same time, uh, financial markets can lead to problems in the economy, in the real side, of, so to speak, the real side of the economy as well. And this could happen in two ways. One, <clears throat> you could have disruptions in the financial markets that are not necessarily related to the rest of the economy, but they affect the rest of the economy through the financial channels, through different credit channels and monetary transmission channels and those kind of things. But also, uh, and this kind of like goes back to David Harvey's comment about uh, volume two, where Marx talks about like when you introduce finance, everything changes. Uh, the whole accumulation process is a financial process at the same time. So whenever you have uh, problems in the actual accumulation process, in the real sector, these problems can actually get worsened by the effect of the financial factor. So, uh, small adverse developments in the, uh, in the real sector can actually turn into uh, major disruptions in the accumulation process because of the problems that are created by the financial sector. So, even when you sort of like think about the, uh, the falling rate of profit arguments, uh, First of all, it's like when you think about it, a small fall in the rate of profit may not necessarily lead to a decline in the investment immediately, but a decline in the profitability could actually have significant effects in the financial relationships, the financial sort of like payment channels, and could actually get sort of like uh, into a downward spill because of those kind of things. So, so that seems to be sort of like a central argument that. Uh, that I make, that is, uh, finance is not necessarily just something, some afterthought, that is, you know, like, we first need to understand what's going on in the real economy and then put finance on top of that. Neither it is something that's 
necessarily just uh, bad okay, in the sense that, you know, whatever bad is coming in the market system, that must be because of financial markets, and if you run in financial markets, then you solve it. But rather, it has a contradictory role. It plays a contradictory role. So, at this point, I'm going to come back to when I talk about the uh, different impacts of financialization uh, on the accumulation process. So that's sort of like the idea. But before I do that, I think it's also important, after defining financialization, it's also important to think about uh, why we have this process. What caused the financialization to emerge? The, one of the sort of like uh, dominant uh, theses, or like very widespread theses, in the, especially in the Marxian literature, uh, seems to be the what I call the overaccumulation argument, and there are different versions of uh, of this argument. In one, of what it basically says is that financialization, the rise of the finance, the growth of the financial sector, however you take it, uh, or the involvement of non-financial corporations in the financial markets, their investment in financial assets, and so on and so forth, uh, emerged as a response to the problems in the real economy in the 1970s. So that seems to be sort of like a direct position in the sense that this is what happened, and then uh, capital decided to shift from real accumulation to financial accumulation, that's it. Uh, and the underlying sort of argument is that this is because the profitability in the real sector, in the non-financial sector, was low, and capital began a search for higher profits, that's how it's sort of like went into uh, financial sphere. Now, there are different versions of this. I mean, for example, if you take the monthly review approach, this is because of increased monopolization of the economy. What you have is when you have increased monopolization of the economy, uh, you have an increasing amount of surplus value that needs to be uh, invested in profitable uh, businesses, and it cannot find profitable business opportunities. So that's Essentially, the monopolization is the cause behind this thing. But when you sort of like switch to sort of like other approaches, for example, if you look at uh, Brenner's argument, then they have pretty much the same result. That is, there are no profitable investment reports that are going down, profitable investment opportunities are not uh, plenty. But the reason behind that is increased competition. That is, there's increased international competition coming from Japan, coming from Europe, which is decreasing the profit space. Hence, the firms are in search of uh, alternative ways of uh, using their surplus. And then there's the overaccumulation thesis that uh, uh, Harvey and like, some uh, others are like, uh, sort of like presenting different uh, versions of it. But at the end, they seem to be, I mean, there are a lot of differences uh, among these arguments, but at the end, uh, their explanations seem to be running from problems in the real economy to uh, capital looking for profitable investment opportunities and moving to uh, finance. That seems to be uh, at a very general level, some sort of duality between the financial markets and the real markets. Uh, the way I see it, uh, there are a couple of shortcomings of this uh, approach. The first one is this, this uh, one-way causation, in the sense that you have problems in the non-financial sector, you just move to the, non to the financial sector, and somehow the financial sector is profitable. That is, you can somehow make profits in the financial system. The second issue is that uh, it's probably an issue of abstraction, the level of abstraction. But uh, most of the time, capital is seen as a singular entity. That is, you know, capital could not find investment opportunities here, and then it moved to us here. But whereas uh, it doesn't necessarily sort of explain the choices and the behavior of the firms or like different capitals and how they made these choices and how they made these shifts and so on and so forth. Uh, the third issue I is that somehow most of these arguments, that's related to the uh, first one as well, somehow uh, the financial sector, the financial markets are left as what I call a black box. That is, there's not much analysis of what actually is going on in the financial markets. That is somehow you, know, you go to finance and you make profits. Okay? And that brings us to the problem of like, how do you make profits? in the financial sector when the profitability in the non-financial sector is actually going down. In other words, what are the sources of the financial profits? So, that's, so that opens a whole different discussion. Is it just a uh, cut from the surplus value? 
and if it is just a cut from the surplus value, how do you get more when you know surplus value is not maybe necessarily high, surplus value production is not necessarily high in one sector, you go to the other sector and somehow you get a larger share. Or it could be, you know, this is sort of like an, uh, as I said, a black box, but is it that financialization increases the efficiency of the system so that you know you get more surplus value, or are the financial profits actually coming from some other sphere? Is it you know primitive accumulation, or uh, is it uh, profits upon alienation, or something like that? Or are these you know some of them are purely fictitious uh, profits that is you enter into financial speculation and then somehow you create copies on paper which do not necessarily correspond to surplus value production, which then creates a whole set of other uh, theoretical and empirical problems, because when you use that in the economy, that means that there's going to be some changes in the process. Okay? And the last thing I want to say is that some of them, not all of them, but some of them have this underlying argument that we've been in a crisis since 1970s. That is, the 1970s crisis have, has never been resolved. It's just been pushed away in time. And then, you know, basically, now we have this crisis because we haven't, you know, this is sort of like the, we've sort of like kept uh, suppressing the crisis that was underlying the system. And I do see, and I go into the details of this in the paper, but I do see a lot of problems with this argument, given that the period from 1980s to today, to the financial crisis of 2006, 2008, is a period of uh, a very sort of like a rapid uh, capital accumulation all over the world. And not only like an enlargement of the capital system, but starting in you know, the early 1990s, but you know, introduction of all sorts of different uh, accumulation centers uh, in the world, all sorts of different types of uh, accumulation modes and all those kinds of stuff. So that could be a problematic approach. So instead, I suggest that there are a couple of uh, other things, and that's how we should look at it. Now, the first argument is that financialization should be seen as not only just you know like one development in the post-1980 era, but it should be seen as part of the, uh, or it could even like make the argument as a result of the structural transformations that took place starting at the end of 1970s and early 1980s. And there are people actually who, one way or another, uh, made similar arguments. And there's a second argument here, which is financialization could also be seen as essentially an underlying tendency within capitalism, in the sense that uh, if it, you know, someone said that this should be a basic sort of like macro identity or something like in, uh, the macro conceptualization of the economy in uh, Marxian economics, and there's always this sort of like tendency in capital accumulation to switch from this to this, which, you know, is only kept under control by sort of like some regulations or some uh, other ways, but it's sort of like it's an underlying tendency since the introduction of the uh, stock market and the those uh, corporations. And this has something to do with the risk and liquidity. That is, a capitalist does not really want to be sort of like stuck in one type of investment for a long time and you know just take the whole risk, but rather would prefer to be more liquid and like sort of diversify the risk and uh, and it's an easier sort of like process that you don't have to deal with the production process and so on and so forth. So those are sort of like the uh, two arguments. And there are a couple of other things that we should also consider. One of them <coughs> is that there is some sort of, in this era, there's some sort of a financial logic that's introduced into the system in the sense that uh, there are different sort of like people in the literature using sort of like different conceptualization for this, in the sense that uh, the financial markets have an effect on the non-financial corporate sector because they have the power and they demand certain things. Okay, and that's what I mean by the dominance of the financial logic. Uh, Hobson is one of, one of the people in the literature who actually openly sort of discusses this, and uh, he sort of like uh, uses Marx, uh, usually capital sort of category, saying that uh, Marx actually anticipated that this kind of 
uh, usury capital would actually be uh, subsumed under the capitalist logic, but it seems like the opposite actually happened in the era of financialization. Uh, but you have other people who, for example, Boyer uh, has a model in which the financial sort of criteria essentially determines uh, the investment behavior of the firm. Or the Menil and Levy's argument that uh, basically the alliance of the corporate managers with the shareholders uh, resulted in a situation where the corporations who first had, like who at least in the golden age, had the accumulation of capital as their primary aim now has uh, are run by some sort of financial logic where the aim of the corporations is basically to create value for the shareholders rather than to uh, finance long-term uh, investment. So, so that's sort of like that's an overview. What I do in this paper, and uh, I've done this in a couple of other papers too, so if I'm going to the details of it, is to argue that financialization had uh, significant effects in three areas. The first one is it has significant effects. It essentially changed the relationship in terms of financial, in terms of capital accumulation in the real sector. And the second one, I think I uh, all this morning has talked a lot about it, but uh, sort of like uh, it has significant changes in terms of how labor relates to the system. And then, of course, there's a whole set of like, changes in the financial sector and there's the issue of conceptualizing the financial profits. And here I use the basic argument that is, finance has a contradictory effect on all aspects. In the first case, uh, basically, what financialization does is, at the same time, both to support accumulation in this era and undermine it. Okay, let me just go one by one. Uh, it does undermine investment in, you know, uh, real capital because of the uh, shareholder pressure essentially. That's sort of like one of the fundamental arguments in the sense that uh, what the new shareholder value uh, capitalism creates is some sort of a short-term per perspective for the corporations. So the corporations essentially are uh, in a way giving up long-term projects in the interest of uh, short-term higher profits. This could be in different ways. One of the ways it uh, takes place is by downsizing. Another way it takes place is by actually allocating more of their resources, and this includes not only their internal funds, but like whatever they borrow, into financial markets rather than into real types of uh, real accumulation, real investment, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, uh, one could say that financialization essentially by undermining investment and decreasing investment, uh, in a way helps with the overaccumulation problem because it decreases investment, okay? But uh, on the other side, these financial operations help the non-financial corporations do two things. One, it helps them to augment their profits at a time when the profitability is low, okay? So if you can get high profits, short term, you know, like quick and high profits in the financial markets, then that goes into your profitability, that helps in, your, in terms of your profitability. The second thing is that, uh, which actually looks like something <coughs> on this list, is that a lot of the large corporations started their financial arms essentially not for investment in the financial assets, but to support their own sales. So essentially, like, you know, if you take GM or GE or Sears or you know one of those large corporations, their financial arms are uh, their essential aim is to extend consumer credit to their own consumers. So by doing this, uh, well, they make profits, financial profits as well, by sort of like getting the interest and so on and so forth. But that wasn't the main concern. The main concern was to help the sales. So if you know if you have some sort of over accumulation problem, then or some sort of excess capacity problem, then uh, what financialization of the firms does is it keeps firms who were otherwise unprofitable in business. That is, instead of, you know, you produce all these things and you're not able to sell them, so the profits are going down, normally you just go out of business. 
but you use financial sources to have your own sales and you manage to stay in business for a longer time. Or you use financial investments to support your real accumulation. GM is a case in point in the sense that when you look at GM, you see that for a long time, GM did not make any profits from the sale of cars. But it was a highly profitable corporation. And almost all of the profits were coming from GMAC, the financial arm of GM. So GM, for example, stayed in business and kept investing and kept competing with the others and whatever, thanks to financialization in that sense, which is the contradictory sort of like role of finance uh, in that sense. Lastly, it's also this, you know, I have done my research on that. Actually, that's like sort of like one of the things that I'm trying to get started, but there's some research on it which shows that the establishment of global value chains, the outsourcing of production and all those things are actually expedited, are pushed by financial markets, by shareholders and so on and so forth in the US. That is, there is a lot of pressure on the corporations to move their operations to low cost areas. That's coming from the financial markets. So finance has that kind of an effect on capital accumulation. So what is the net effect here is difficult to figure out. But I'm just like putting these out in the sense that we have to discuss all these things, I think, when we're talking about financialization, rather than just seeing it as a sphere that just capital escapes to when profitability is low here. It does change uh, the accumulation process itself in many different ways. Okay? So that's sort of like the argument uh, here. Now, the second part, the labor part, is well, this is sort of like part of this argument is out there, and some of it all actually talked about in his presentation in the morning. But um, finance had sort of like two effects on labor, two broad effects. On the one side, one of the results of the financial market pressure on the non financial corporations has been to push them to decrease their labor costs. And this they did by sort of like, I mean, increased profitability in the short run. This is sort of like corresponded to outsourcing as well as, uh, you know, layoffs and all those kind of things. And there are different ways of doing it. For example, uh, in the post-2000 era, until the financial crisis, there was a huge wave of private equity funds buying out companies, buying out corporations. And one of the first things that they would do as soon as they bought out a company was to create the labor contracts, create the health benefits or whatever, like things that the old company could not break, contracts that the old company could not break. They would go in, buy the firm, so basically, you know, like take it out of public, and you know, that's why they call private equity funds. And the first thing that they did, and the second thing would be like assets stripping and those kind of things, maybe, but the first thing they did was to break the labor contracts. And they're actually in the financial literature, that is, uh, in the, in the finance literature, there are actually uh, interesting studies which uh, look at uh, one look at different companies' stock market performance and see how their stock market performance changes when those companies announce layoffs or downsizing. And as soon as a company announces a layoff or like a downsizing, their stock price starts going up. So if one of the things that the, that changed in this era was to maximize shareholder value, that is, increase the value of shares and so on and so forth. That was like one of the things. If you sort of like cut the labor force, then you know that's one way that your uh, stock price is gonna uh, is gonna increase. And then the second part of it actually is you know quite well known by now that you know all these undermined labor income. But finance was filling the gap uh, through two channels. One was the credit channel, the increasing amount of credit. The other one is what we can call the asset market keynesianism in the sense that the increase in the, uh, in the asset values was one of the things that kept uh, helping with the labor's consumption. At, you know, on sort of but this itself, of course, you know, clearly has a contradictory effect as well because in the short run, it does help people to consume more and to buy all those things. But then you have to pay the interest, so there's a deduction from your already going down uh, income. Okay, so that's a uh, that's the second thing. Finally, uh, what we need to do is to look at uh, the role of the financial.
financial institutions, the banks and other financial institutions, uh, in this setup. That is, how exactly is the financial markets relating <coughs> to the non-financial sector, the financial institutions or banks? Because we're talking about the change, that especially around the 1970s, when the non-financial corporations stopped uh, using bank loans and then started direct financing, for example. What are the implications of that? How is that uh, changing the setup? And how is that? How, how are those markets working? Because one of the things that happened right after the uh, 2007 financial crisis, when the financial crisis began in 2007, was that the market that corporations borrowed and the uh, commercial market paper froze. So that was like the first impact of the crisis on direct impact of the crisis on the, which is a market where most of the corporations actually raise. Uh, their working capital, which they use for the day-to-day -day production activities. So that has quite significant implications. And then again, we have to figure out and we have to sort of like have a, both a theoretical and empirical handle on the issue of where these financial profits are coming from, how do you account for them, especially when we like, you know, when a lot of us are like putting a lot of emphasis on the rate of profit, uh, how we account for the financial profits uh, in the total profits. You know, it, again, it depends on how you see them, whether you see them as a redistribution of surplus value or whether you see them just as fictitious profits will have uh, quite significant implications. So that's sort of like the other thing. Uh, okay, so what am I not doing in this paper uh, is developing an integrated theory of real and financial components of equation, which I think should be done. And I think it should uh, take into account all these different changes that have taken place in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, and this is, again, this is sort of like a matter of level of abstraction at the same time as well. You could say that certain, certain things have not changed within the capital system and certain relationships, but a lot of them have changed as well, maybe, you know, like that. So we have to be able to uh, explain them and have a good sort of like handle on them. And why, you know, as I was doing this, uh, the question that popped in my mind was, why are we doing this? Like, you know, why do we care? Like, and the answer is because of its, I guess, uh, policy conclusions and implications. And that's also like one of the things that was sometimes, you know, like discussed uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop as well, that is, when you have different theories, depending on the theory, depending on the explanation you have, you usually have different policy conclusions, different implications. That is, it seems like there's sort of like three broad camps. One is the finance as a problem. If you see what's happening because, it is because of the finance, then what you're going to suggest is going to be different. If you think neoliberalism is the problem, then you have different policy conclusions. But if you think that all these problems are real, they exist, but they exist in a capitalist sort of structure, and then you'll have a different sort of like thing. Not only that, but I think uh, a better sort of like uh, understanding of this will also help us, a better analysis on this will also help us to sort of develop a better understanding of the class structure uh, in, the, in the financialization era, neoliberal era, whatever you <coughs> uh, call that. And then finally, all this will probably uh, have implications in terms of how you talk to people and in terms of, you know, uh, what you suggest in terms of, uh, you know, how you deal with the 99% uh, uh, movement to occupy Wall Street movement, how you sort of, it has a lot of implications, I think, the way that you sort of like present your argument and the way you sort of like uh, see uh, this. And I am going to stop here. I have five more minutes. So I'll use that later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, comments, contributions. <laughs> okay, Stavros, we can hear from you this way. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, well, I understand this was a review paper. Uh, the mic? Uh, oh, sorry. This, is, this was a review paper, very extending, very helpful in uh, Latin in many senses. However, I would like to have your answers, at least your preliminary answers regarding four questions. First, is, uh, in your opinion, financialization a new stage, a passing phenomenon, 
or a main feature of a new stage. I think this has been a, 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 not a debate, but a, a, a question lingering around in many uh, of the presentations touching upon financialization this way of course. So, um, together with that, uh, if, uh, if financialization is either of, of these, is it in crisis, uh, which I think most of its proponents uh, accept? And uh, this crisis means that it is ending. And if it is ending, what is uh, that we have succeeded? Or is there any, yes, even why one? Uh, second point, has financialization demolished the distinction between the productive and the money capital? That is a trad traditional fundamental marks and distinctions. Uh, about uh, the, the basic forms of capital. Um, related to that is a, a, a terminological uh, thing, whether you refer to finance or to finance capital. Uh, finance capital taking it in uh, the problematic uh, Hilf, uh, the definition of Hilferding. Uh, means, okay, finance has acquired an importance, but uh, uh, it is like a parasite. It's living on the body uh, and it's thriving on the body of productive capital. Whereas finance, as Lapavitsas usually tends to use the term nowadays, means something different, uh, completely different. Uh, if uh, it is the second case, uh, the first case, finance, then this uh, doesn't this imply that we are meaning about a new class structure, mm -hmm. different from capitalism as we know, know it till today. And um, last thing, and That's it's not a, la, a fourth point, a fourth? Fourth point uh, does fictitious capital has any role in explaining financialization? However, it's been theorized or it's a useless concept. Do you want me to answer all of them or just one of them? Whatever you like. Uh, well, I mean, okay, is, let me start with this. Is financialization a new stage or a passing phenomena? I think those two don't necessarily, you know, any new stage is a passing phenomena. So, uh, but it is a new stage in the sense that it's different, in the sense that what I argue is that it did change certain things in terms of capital accumulation process. Not necessarily like the basics of it. So it's a stage on its own? I would say so. I mean, like part of the other transformations, of course. But not, not only it's the only song, but like with the other transformations, yes. That is, you know, uh, it changed how the firms are like allocating their resources, it changed how they're looking at the accumulation process and so on and so forth, and the accumulation strategies and those kind of things. Uh, which then takes you to the other question that is, the distinction between the productive and money capital, that, that is, which is, what you have now is quite different than the than Hilferding's finance capital. Yes, you know, I agree on that. But the distinction uh, between them is not quite clear anymore, which is a big problem, which is a big theoretical and empirical problem in the sense that when you look at the non-financial corporations, they actually have all these huge financial operations going on. So it's not the domination of the, the banks on the firms or some such thing this time, but you know, on the contrary, you have this. But then you can go on to the other side as well, which I haven't mentioned much, but uh, if you look at the financial sector, they have huge product operations, which are usually under leasing uh, investments. That is, they actually invest in a lot of uh, capital, and then they lease it to the firms. So for example, a lot of corporations don't own their own whatever, you know, uh, capital goods, but they leave them from financial co corporations. So it really makes it a lot more complicated than, uh, than the standard theory that we have, when it, especially when it comes to sort of like measuring these things. Because, you know, the accounting that they do is, uses like different concepts that we do, so it's like quite difficult to uh, do that. And, uh, in terms of the class structure, I mean, uh, that's also another issue. That is, we were talking about it in the morning in terms of like uh, supervisory workers and those kind of things. But uh, I think it also goes back to the to the rate of profit calculations as well. That is, 
What do you do with the huge incomes of the managerial class and the CEOs and those kind of things? They're not really labor income. So somehow you have to put them back uh, into the profit rate, for example. So there's those uh, implications as well. Uh, and that was it, I guess. Oh yeah, that, that, that was the other thing about fictitious capital. What was the question about the fictitious capital? Oh, whether the concept of fictitious capital has any role in analyzing financialization is just uh, um, a useless. No, I mean, I think I have, I, mean, I haven't used it in this in, 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 my, in my work much, but I thought you know, it's, uh, it's well, I think you could conceptualize <coughs> Uh, over fictitious capital as well. There's a significant distinction actually in the sense that uh, the difference between fictitious capital and loan capital will, I guess, uh, could actually provide some sort of a different perspective on the whole financialization uh, discussion as well, but I haven't gone there. Okay, um, there's lots of people wanting to talk, so let's, let's just go round. Anu, David Kotz, Ben, John, the last time. Well, I want to thank you for this very useful survey because it it's always good to see what the state of the debate and what issues are underlying it. Um, I, I think it's important to keep a distinction between firms and capitals because uh, oh, sorry, did it again. Uh, the really the whole point even from the very beginning of this discussion of Marx, is that capitals have functions and firms can cut across these capitals. So it's not a, it should not be a puzzle in any way that General Motors has a finance function. It also has a commercial function, has a production function. It's all in the same company. And yes, they can split off, but that doesn't affect the fact that they are different functions in the start. Uh, and then the second point is that you mentioned that takeovers are used to break labor oh. contracts. But keep in mind that's only true when labor is weak enough to uh, not be able to resist that. It's not takeovers per se. Concentration centralization is a very old issue, but it's what they confront. And I'm sure it's a different situation, at least at some time in the past, where these happen and they simply have to inherit everything. So that's a, it's the issue that I'll raise, which is a separate issue of the class struggle and the loss of labor strength, which allows these things to become tools. The third issue is the credit channel has uh, in both individual effects and aggregate effects. It's very important, obviously, uh, an individual firm can benefit from credit, can use it as a takeover, but when you add up the sum of these effects, you get a huge boost to overall spending, either on financial assets, and uh, therefore a return at some time in the future, which has to be bigger because you have to take interest out of it. And that loop that reflux that Marx emphasized has big implications for the last issue, which is limits. Mm. Because as you build up the debt, you're putting a greater call on the future of income, which means the income has to be growing in order for you to pay off your debt. Any one of us who has debt understands this issue. And if your income goes down, then uh, you, you, the moment of this bubble is burst. And that brings us, ties it back to the theme of this whole conference, which is, why does income go down? What's, what causes a crisis? In very important ways, financialization accelerates accumulation. It, it causes real surplus value to be accelerated, because it makes it cheaper to, to invest capital. But it also builds up this huge call on the future. And then, uh, inevitably, a limit. George Soros says that he makes his money from this dynamic. That when the system is off its fundamentals, he rides it on the way up. When he thinks it's gone too far, he tries to sell. And uh, his particular mechanism is, he says, when his back hurts. And that's how he knows when the downturn is coming. He's, and if he sells, the downturn comes anyway. So I don't know what the causal mechanism is. But this is what brings us back to the point, fundamentals. Surplus value, produced, circulated, split up, re-split and split again, and many of those flows capitalized into fictitious capital. The more you split up the flows, the more the pyramid of <coughs> coming out from this base gets built up, and therefore the more comes down when there's an earthquake at the bottom. So I think it's possible to link all of these things together, 
uh, to the theme of the conference, uh, which is what causes the underlying, the bottom part to quake? Where's the earthquake coming from? Don't forget, Soros gives some of those profits to Marxist economists. Indeed, indeed. I'm a beneficiary of INET, and I got uh, uh, funding to finish my book on the critique of capitalism. The book's name is, by the way, Capitalism. You're so, being uh, recorded. Yeah, no, well, that's true. A benefit of a bad back. Yeah. My back's been bad for a while. Okay. I mean, I would just say a couple of things in the sense that. Yes, the distinction between the firm and capitalism is important, and I totally agree with that. Uh, but the argument here is that when, that, well, there are two problems. When that distinction is not clear, it has implications for the behavior of the firm. <coughs> so when they like, you know, involved in two different sort of like capital sort of like uh, circulations, and it does have effect, well, they affect each other in getting involved in the financial circle that affects how you behave in the uh, productive circuit as well. That's sort of like the argument I have. In terms of the, the takeover issue, yes, of course. I mean, it's like if labor has plenty of power, then a takeover won't be enough to sort of like, you know, break the contract. But what I'm saying is that uh, takeovers or like other types of, sort of financial interventions have actually been able to do what uh, the, what was not what the others could not do, in the sense that they were effective, they were operational, and that was one of the competitive effects of uh, finance in that sense, they were actually successful uh, in that. So, uh, I think I'll stop there, so you know, you can ask that. I want to come back to some of the issues again. David was next. Uh, two points. Uh, uh, one, uh, He's gone. Well, to the seat where, to the seat where, where Arthur was previously sitting. Uh, uh, I'd like you to comment on uh, how to avoid making uh, the category of uh, finance so broad that it includes practically everything. Uh, in the early days of capitalism, there were productive enterprises, you know, usually owned by one person. There was a bank with an owner, and you could see productive, financial, capital, you could look at the relations between them. In the current era, there are all corporations. The productive corporation has shareholders of various <coughs> kinds, uh, so does the bank. If, if a productive corporation uh, is distributing dividends to its shareholders or doing share buybacks, why should we necessarily consider that a distribution to, to finance? Uh, where are the productive capitalists? Are, is productive capital just General Motors Corporation? Uh, or does it include some, some other entities uh, that are owners of it? I think that should be clarified. Are you asking uh, like, where are the productive capitals, or are you asking where are the productive capitalists? Well, either, however you wish to interpret it. How, you know, wh why is that a distribution to finance when, you know, if there's some 10% shareholder or a family that has 10% of General Motors, that's all they own. Why is that a distribution to finance? Uh, and the second uh, question uh, is about the, the uh, movement of capital from productive activity uh, into financial activity. Why doesn't that drive down the rate of profit in uh, financial activity, just like it would in productive activity, thereby undermining one of the arguments? Uh, uh, what do you think of the view that uh, financial investment can be fundamentally different in this regard? That uh, under certain conditions, increasing funds flowing into financial investment can create bubble-like processes in which the more funds that flow in, the higher the profit rate goes, with everyone making profit, selling assets back and forth to one another. And thus, it can, the financial sector can absorb growing amounts of capital without any tendency to drive down the profit rate. Is that perhaps a factor in these relations? Okay, uh, let me just start with the second one. Uh, increased movement into financial investments does actually decrease financial profit, which I think is one of the reasons. I mean, there is the bubble process and all that kind of stuff, but it does decrease the profit, and which is one of the reasons why uh, in the 2000s these large banks have got involved in uh, increasing the risk of activities. That was like one of the reasons that is, they, have to, they have to do these things 
It was not only because you know they were greedy or they were stupid, but they had to do this in order to sort of like make those high profits, keep making uh, those high profits, you know, that actually necessitated them to get into these highly you know like risky activities uh, that were going to bring you know like these high returns. So that's sort of like that's how I see it. It does, yes, the financial sector also you know like creates all these fictitious you know profits and those kind of things. But even then, you know. Uh, increasing moment in that in some parts of the financial sector does actually decrease uh, the profits, especially for the uh, investment banks or the hedge funds and those kind of uh, enterprises. In terms of defining finance, that's a good question. I mean, for example, we did that maybe define finance as basically you know, all the capitalists. Yeah. And when you define it that way, then you know, really, what does it mean to sort of like uh, give more to the financial markets? Uh, and okay. <coughs> In terms of you know like how do you distinguish between uh, the owners of productive capital versus the financiers who are getting a share out of that, I think the important thing uh, here is that a lot of the shareholders in this case are institutional investors who are uh, trying to increase their short-term profits from their investments in these uh, in these firms, which does imply sort of like a different. Uh, type of uh, ownership. It's basically they have these funds, they invest these funds in these companies, and they keep shifting those funds from firm to firm, you know, from one stock to the other, or from one type of financial investment to the other, depending on uh, the return that they get from these activities. So, uh, but it is, I mean, I don't know what you think about this or the others, but in a way, they are the owners of productive capital. At least you know at that very moment, but they're not you know sort of the classical owners of capital that are only looking at you know the sort of like surplus if they account of surplus, but they're actively you know like sort of shuffling their uh, investment around the market. Essentially, yeah. yeah. So that's okay. I think we were going round. It's Ben next, I think. I was on the point of withdrawing, but you never give up the chance at all. <laughs> I mean, I very much welcome your paper, and, and uh, I would really like to push forward the understanding of, of financialization, both in theoretical ways and empirically, which is what I want to tr try and do by, first of all, picking up on your example of General Motors, where the selling of cars and other consumer goods, especially durables on credit, is by no means new. Um, and uh, that I don't see as financialization, although the scale on which this is going may have increased. Financialization is the selling on of that credit book to, uh, within the financial system. And then that makes it incorporated into what I would call interest bearing, bearing capital, uh, with claims on, on future surplus. What I want to do is introduce another example, uh, in many ways to, to reinforce the idea that the mechanisms through which financialization affects both the production and circulation of value and surplus value is highly diverse, something I'll pick up uh, tomorrow. And I'm going to do this by reference to the work we've been doing on the water privatization in the UK, which is very, very different from water privatization and provision in other countries. The first thing to say is what privatization in the UK has led to huge levels of investment. And the reason why there have been huge le 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 levels of investment is because that's the only way to meet the regulatory requirements and therefore to guarantee the secure revenues that come from providing water. All done on credit because that investment, credit to the consumer because you're not paying for the huge investment costs which are being laid out. However, in every other respect, the water privatization in Britain is a classic example of uh, financialization of the sorts and the effects that we've been talking about uh, over the last couple of days. Labor costs and levels of employment have been dramatically decreased. Workers have to buy their own boots for health and safety reasons, etc., etc. The salary differentials have opened up hugely. Dividend payments are out of recognition. Uh, as indeed our interest payments as proportions of costs. Sorry, I'm getting a bit excited here. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of financialization, um, the owners of the privatized water companies in the UK, there are 10 of them, predominantly are hedge funds, internationally organized infrastructure companies, who have as pyramids of ownership, 
leading all the way to the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. They use the secure revenues, and this is what financialization is, as a basis on which to secure other forms of finance, which they can invest anywhere uh, in the world. The regulators are unwilling to monitor their interest costs, which are excessive, because the argument is interest costs will be regulated by a perfectly committed competitive finance market. This is also politically unacceptable because um, Britain has a very large infrastructure build, build program and uh, any harder regulation on water would lead to um, uh, failure to invest in their major infrastructural programs. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is First of all, theoretically, it's the incorporation of the production of surplus value and the accumulation of surplus value into the financial system, including the appropriation of, of surplus value, as the, not through the rate of interest, but through all sorts of other mechanisms, which characterizes financial, financialization. And the consequences, and the incidents and the consequences of this are extremely uneven. Uh, and this is something that we needs to be to be uh, acknowledged. Thank you. You were within your forty five minutes. I think I agree. Okay. Well, I mean, I think he agrees with me. Yeah, Johnny. That is. Uh, all, yeah. The only thing I'm going to say about <coughs> is the GM example and those kind of things are not new. Yes, and Sears credit card, for example, store cards were used in the 1970s. But what changed after the 1980s is like the size of their operations and the way that they operate as well. That is, they. You know, they use the financial markets actively, they raise funds, and then they use those funds to you know, support their sales and so on and so forth. So this, I think there's a quantitative change, at least. Okay. Um, it's a good paper. I think we're going to have a very strong... Uh, microphone. Oh, sorry, yeah. I think we're going to have a very strong discussion of financialization in the book, uh, which is going to be a, a, a selling uh, point from it. Uh, we've got, uh, 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 Simon's and Jan's and now, now yours, and that's very good. Do we get a higher share of the? <laughs> well, yes, you, you'll get um, you know one forty second of the royalties uh, all for yourself. Um, the um, and we're taking uh, you know Piketty's uh, um, uh, five hundred fifty thousand as our target. A um, couple of subsequent points quickly. Um, there are some Keynesians who say there can't be any recovery without a complete, you know, shake-up of the financial sector. Uh, Jenny Galbraith uh, uh, comes to mind. You might want to mention that in passing. You know you're old when you go to a lecture by someone in his 50s who is a son of someone you went to a lecture in previously. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, profit and uh, competition, or think about this, I mean, for the capitalist economy as a whole, we would never say competition drives the uh, profit rate down, profit rate is determined, uh, uh, competition, uh, following Marx, competition distributes profit, it doesn't uh, affect the, uh, the, rate, uh, the rate of profit. Uh, if, uh, what determines profit in uh, uh, the financial sector, uh, somebody in his paper on financial, what might want to talk about that. Um, you could, you know, take the position of Marx on uh, the interest rate as an irrational farm and say it really could be anything. Um, and finally, uh, just as we could have a specific question, you don't have to put in your paper. What do you think of uh, Bill Azamic's stress on, uh, you know, um, uh, buybacks as a cause of bubbles and instability in the stock market. I'm just interested in your, your view on that. Um, okay. The first one, the, uh, there are Keynesians who argue that you won't get a recovery before you have a total shake-up of the, of the financial system. There are Keynesians who also argue that there are problems in the productive sector as well, like Tom Talley, for example, that makes that argument. And I think that's where, you know, like my argument of this continuity effect is important in the sense that, okay, let's get rid of, and sort of like that relates to uh, MRSH's point as well, okay, let's get rid of all these, you know, like financial things, but then you go back to something else, you know, either like the fundamentals <coughs> that MRSH is talking about, or a system where you don't have these positive feedbacks of financialization on the capital accumulation. 
So, uh, in terms of Lazonic's uh, argument, I think that's a pretty, and I know the argument, uh, and the argument itself makes sense, except, I mean, I think it should be an easy empirical question. That is, you know, we know when these buybacks are happening, and we know the moments of the stock market, and it actually, I don't know if someone did that exercise, but that's, that's something that can actually be easily done to make things like so. Okay, we have Ahmed and then David over there. Yeah, uh, my question uh, has to do with some conceptual clarity, maybe even terminological clarity. And when you deal with financialization's negative uh, effect, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis undermining investment, you dealt with downsizing. Mm -hmm. And then when you move to uh, the other slide, I forgot what the title was, and then you talk about layoffs, and, and layoffs basically augmenting you know, profitability. And, but actually downsizing you know, usually takes the form of layoff anyway, and then they, unless you specifically mean, I assume that's what you meant, you know, physical uh, investment, and you have a point. But even in, in that situation, I think, because you reduce the denominator and then you probably augment profitability by downsizing you know, per se. So I mean some sort of you know, conceptual clarity in the sense that even when you talk about downsizing, I think you could refer to possibility of uh, increasing profitability. I, yeah, I think I should have said, uh, yes, I, I, I get your point from that. That's that sort of like the downsizing in the sense of physical sort of like the shutting down the plants and moving somewhere else and this kind of thing. Which in more layoffs as well, yes. Maybe. Yeah, in my, in my, uh, uh, in my, many, may probably regard as my very idiosyncratic reading of Marx. Um, I came to the conclusion that one of the questions Marx was investigating was why would, would it happen that in a purely capitalist mode of production, in which production capital is or should be hegemonic, why would they tolerate the existence of bankers, financiers, and the like? Uh, and those financiers having the, what he calls well, the Emile, um, Emile Berer, the banker and secretary of Empire Paris, that had the charming character of swindler and profit, profit and pH. Um, and when I was putting all of the stuff on volume three into the volume two, I came to the following conclusion, which I think is rather important for uh, explaining why the functions of finance capital, banks and so on are, are, are so important. That when you look at what is going on in volume two, not the reproduction scheme, but there's a lot about differential turnover time and particularly differential turnover times of fixed capital. And if you attach to that all the stuff about how does physical infrastructures in the built environment get financed, uh, how is housing built, all of these kinds, all these kinds of things. And what, what comes out, actually, is Marx excludes the credit system from this, but what you see is so much hoarding would have to take place in order to replace fixed capital, that there would actually be no money left for investment in production of surplus value. And what the credit system does, he's very clear in volume three, is it releases all of that hoarded capital so it can go off and actually start producing surplus value. So it's not correct to say that what the financiers do is to actually uh, diminish the capacity for profitability. The more they can get in there and substitute their activities uh, to reduce hoarding, so that hoarding goes to zero for almost all producers because they simply borrow on all the stuff, then there's an immense increase in the amount of surplus value uh, production. And it's for that reason that capitalists cannot do without a credit system. They absolutely have to have it. Uh, and this becomes even more important, of course, as capital becomes more complex and more elaborate. Uh, because, you know, if you want to build all this out here uh, as part of a capitalist infrastructure, then, you, you, you know, this is not like just, you know, building a little factory and a few houses. This is, I mean, this is massive. 
And I think that actually what this means is that financialization becomes even more and more significant because of the need to make even com more complicated turnover times and, 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 and mesh together. And, and remember, you know, hedge funds were originally set up uh, for farmers to, de to deal with uh, the, the, the problem that they only produce a crop once a year and they didn't know what the crop was going to be like. You know, right? so, so they had to hedge. So, so I think that actually you, should, you might want to go back to basics and talk a little bit about that as the foundation of what, uh, of what this whole system is about and why, therefore, uh, at this historical moment, uh, finance capital, which was there back in the early 19th century and of course did pick up in the, uh, after mid-century, why it's become even more important now uh, to deal with this particular kind of uh, problem. And then of course there's the, the, the interesting question of the turnover time within finance capital itself and the nanoseconds and the nano trading and all those kinds of things. But it's a, it, it, I, think this, I think this timing thing is, is, is crucial. Uh, well. Um, thank you. Uh, well, one thing I just want to say, and I have a question for you, is I did sort of like, you know, when you were talking about the contradictory role of finance, I was kind of like inspired by the 1982 Limits to Capital, uh, Chapter 12, when you talk about Chapter 12, I don't know, when you were talking about this. But I'm just, I have a question for you. But when you say like differential sort of like turnover times and the role of finance in this, what are you exactly referring to? Like how does how is finance sort of like well, getting into this picture? Well, 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 a simple example is is agriculture. Uh, I mean, you 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 have a cotton crop once a year, and if there's only one place where cotton's grown, then it's mm -hmm. going to come in just at that time of year. And you then you know how do the cotton farmers get financed for the rest of the year? How, how does the cotton industry deal with the fact that the supply of cotton comes in mm -hmm. in, I don't know, September and October and there's no more cotton? Mm -hmm. uh, and then how do they keep their fixed capital fully employed? Uh, if you want to, my, my favorite example, which I cite in the book, is, is, is why, why the, the British eat marmalade, bitter oranges, because they had a conserve industry uh, which fully used fixed capital up until about uh, October, November, December, but there was no fresh fruit to do, so they went off to Spain and found these bitter oranges and they make marmalade you know, <laughs> and, uh, to, keep their fixed, to keep their fixed capital fully employed. And then, of course, this added, by the way, to the energy of the working classes because yeah. it was highly sugared stuff and it was put on bread and you know, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to talk about marmalade? <laughs> but, but, but when you see, you see the point that, that, that actually in many, in many industries, the inputs can be had either in big lumps like this, you know, you build a factory and, and then that's it. And, and, and there's, there's a continuous supply of some materials and there's you know, discrete chunks of uh, dis uh, supply of uh, a forklift truck or something like that. And so the way you deal with, the, with all of these differential turnover times, uh, and particularly fixed capital has different lifetimes, uh, then, then, then there are all these things that that need to be put together. And it's only through the credit system that you can smooth all that out and actually figure out something about the rate of return, which of course is the rate of, uh, uh, the rate of interest. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's one other thing which I would add. You've got to remember, money is a crucial moment in the circulation of capital, and money is not finance. The big question is, when does money itself become a commodity that can be bought and sold uh, at a rate of interest? And this is very weird, because money is a measure. And you know you can't buy and sell kilos. You can only buy and sell kilos of potatoes. But you can actually buy a hundred dollars uh, for hundred and ten dollars in order to use that hundred dollars to make hundred and twenty dollars. Okay. Okay. Who who still has something to? Uh, I have a question. Ben wants to speak. Anybody else? Right. Uh, let, let me go first. Oh. Well, I, actually, I, I just have a, a, a simple question, which is, in all the discussions of financialization that we've had over the last few days, the concept of fictitious capital hasn't really been there. In, I mean, it might have been there, but it hasn't been mentioned much. And I'm curious, 
I'm curious as to how you would define fictitious capital. Sometimes in the literature, you see it defined effectively as any capitalization of an income stream. Sometimes you see it defined more narrowly as some sort of excess of this capitalization over and above some notion of real underlying value in some sense. So, so it doesn't seem to me to be a concept that, that has an unambiguous definition. I wondered how you would look at it. Well, I mean, frankly, that's the main reason why I kind of avoided the concept. <laughs> in the sense that it does have all these different things. And in this paper, I just want to go into how would you define it? I mean, what is, hmm. what is your I am as confused as the literature. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me feel a lot better. Ben. So I've got a question for Anwar, really, but through you, since uh, <laughs> this is the only way I can do it. Sure. I think Anwar gave a very, very graphic and appropriate description of the construction of what I think many of us would call financialization and how the whole edifice comes tumbling down um, in a crisis. But that raises the question of, well, it happens all the time. It's not just in a crisis. And I think... One of the big differences that there may be, and I think, again, this is where I think your paper is very, very useful, and some others, is this process of financialization and its impact upon the accumulation and efficacy of capital, both in the economic and social arena, is not confined simply to the period when capitalism is in crisis. This is the nature of the way in which restructuring of capital and accumulation of capital is taking place all of the time in the neoliberal period, period. And what defines that neoliberal period is the extent to which that financialization is so far into the forefront. And uh, your indirect question to Anwar is? I will just reflect the question. Does he agree? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I... Go through again. Yes, that was <laughs> One of the things... Uh, hit, hit your mic. I'm sorry. One of the things that was... Uh, that came up in your talk was this issue of a bubble. Uh -huh. And the, the very notion of a bubble implies that it's a deviation from some fundamentals. And that was the point I was trying to make in my story, right. so that we have to have a theory of what the fundamental price of a stock is or a bond is. I believe it's possible to do that. And then be able to identify from there uh, when the deviation takes place. And that leads to the second issue. If there is a deviation, and as I think people pointed out, it's self-reinforcing, then why does it ever come down? I mean, you know, if everybody wants to buy a stock, it goes up in value. And the rate of return on the holding of the stock goes up. And more people buy it, then it keeps on going. And Soros' answer, which I think is actually very important, is that the further away you get from the fundamentals, the more the unsustainability of it becomes a matter of concern. And people, um, at some point, bail out. And as soon as they bail out, it comes back, shoots past, crashes, and so on. So there's an idea of a regulation of a bubble by its underlying fundamentals. And we don't really have a good handle on that uh, in, in most of our discussions. Did that answer satisfy you, Ben? <laughs> nope. <laughs> and on that I'm going to add my, my question, yeah. Mr. Swansa, is what is the value of the right not to pollute in the future? What's the real value of that? And what, when would you know when that was in a bubble, a bubble or not because it's got a real value? I don't think capitalism gives a shit. I mean, I, let's be clear about that. The, the fundamentals come to issues about profitability. If, if you can make profit from pollution, it has a high value. I mean, I, I think the issue is not a social value. But in that circuit, you're saying the value is the profit. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference between the local rate of profit and the rate of return that's uh, comparable to a real rate of return. And that, I can, you know, can't get into here, but one can actually measure these things and one can look at that and identify bubbles that way. And it's quite striking that they come back around. Now, the issues about uh, the value in the sense that what value can capital place on this, that's a separate question. And I, I don't think it actually cares whether it's value in society, why should it? Okay, we're, we're running short of time. Al and David Cotts still wish to speak, so I suggest, since this is quite a fruitful discussion, we continue with very short questions and very short answers, if possible. Very short question. Uh, very short question, also by Ganwar, I suppose, through Oscar channeling it once again. Um, just the way you posed that thing, you said we could determine the basic value, 
And then you put forward the same sort of story that uh, Ronald Reagan put forward in some sort of sense. You argued that people get nervous as it gets too far from that true value. And then at some point they bail, and when it bails, it causes it to collapse. If that's the real mechanism, then all they have to do is not get nervous, and it will never collapse. Uh, am I supposed to comment on this? No, that, that's, I think, I think, I'll respond to it. I think we need to move to David. I think Honor was quite right. Uh, for the most common uh, subjects of uh, asset bubbles, real estate, corporate securities, there, there is an anchor for real estate. It's the rental value of land, and you can draw a chart. And you can see it go up and up and up in the 2000s. And for in the, in the 90s, you can it's the price earnings ratio. So you can measure these things. Now, uh, the ultimate limit is the bubble expands as long as there's more money that can be drawn in. Eventually, you run out of people with access to money uh, who can be drawn in. That's the absolute limit, although it is always reached before that absolute limit arises when some information causes some percentage of investors to think that the end is near. All the people in it know the end is going to come, and they're waiting so that they can get out before they get trounced. And on that note, maybe you have a cup of tea. <laughs> is there anything you wish to add? <laughs> very good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.